brought my family. Uh, so, hello everybody. Um, maybe some people here that haven't heard me speak before. I'm getting bored listening to myself. I've said things that often, but never mind. So, <clears throat> I retired from the, the prison service just over two years ago and started speaking out about this stuff just after. I couldn't... Is that better? Okay. Okay, a bit louder even? Okay. Um, I couldn't speak about it while I was a prison governor because we're effectively civil servants and you, you can't talk about it. Any forays I did make into being gender critical got me into trouble. Uh, I said horrendous things like biology is immutable and that was enough for a particular councillor to demand that I was sacked from my job as prison governor. I wasn't but it hasn't stopped them attacking me since. I have to say that over that two years or so that I've been speaking out, I've had more abuse than I did in my whole ten years as a prison governor. And that's saying something when I had a guy that was a cannibal that threatened to eat me. So um, for it to top that, it's, it's really been quite a two years. Um, when I joined the prison service in 2009, I would have described myself as a trans ally. And I had known trans people, had had not close friends, but acquaintances that were trans, and I was really okay with it all. Um, and then in 2010, when I was the Deputy Governor of Berlin, uh, we got a call to, from the courts to say that there was a trans woman on their way in from the court. And I was appalled that they were sending a trans woman to a male prison, um, not least Berlin, which of course is the barrel, the big hoose if you come from Glasgow. Um, so when the person came in, um, we tried to rustle up some staff, to, some female staff to search them and so on. And I even said I would do it myself if nobody else wanted to do it. And I immediately arranged for that person's transfer to Contonville. I then met no more uh, trans people in the prison service because it was only ever about one a year, maybe two. Um, at that time, though, I did request that headquarters put together a policy on transgender prisoners because we had no policy. It was just a bit kind of haphazard what happened to them when they came into prison. And there was never, believe me, there was never any suggestion that there would be a female identifying as trans coming into a prison. Nobody would even have thought of it. So in about, that, that was it. Never met any more trans people till about 2000, halfway through 2014 when I went to be governor of Conton Vale. And while I was there, um, we got a trans woman in, so a male who identifies as, as trans in. And they were a person with quite... Uh, I would say severe mental health problems. So we put them in the unit for very vulnerable women. And I, I can't describe, if, you, if you've ever been in prison yourself, you'll have met some of these women, if you've ever worked in a prison. But they are women who are just the poorest of the poor in every way, in terms of their mental and physical well-being, their emotional well-being, their trauma backgrounds, the whole lot. They have had the worst lives and have the worst lives of any people I've ever known. Anyway, we, we housed the, the trans women uh, with these prisoners because we thought that was the right thing to do. And then, uh, not long after being admitted there, the trans women decided that they were male again and demanded to be moved back to the male estate. And furthermore, because we weren't doing it quick enough, threatened to rape any female prisoners or female staff they could get their hands on. So we had to move them into segregation. We moved them up to the male estate and they decided they were female again. And this went on and on and on. And um, that, that person came to an extremely sad end. And it's, I think, a, a, an absolute tragedy that the fact that they were trans, to me, became clear that that was part of their mental health issues and it wasn't being addressed. But that was a real turning point for me because I thought, no, wait a wee minute, there is something terribly, terribly wrong here that we cannot even challenge someone's notion or ask them why. You can't ask them why. And this was at the time when Stonewall was just all kicking off with moving from being an LGB organisation to being an LGB trans organisation because they barely talk about LGB now. And of course their motto is acceptance without exception or acceptance without question. So that has become the dominant narrative. So I met a few uh, trans women in Corton Vale, maybe, uh, maybe just two actually, two or three. And without um, any doubt, I had no doubt in my mind that they... Now I don't even know what it means to say genuinely trans because to me, I'm going to be really upfront, there's, there's no such thing as trans. 
There are people who have gender dysphoria. There are people who believe themselves to be the other sex, but of course it is a physical, scientific impossibility to be the other sex. And what I want to say to people who think you can be born in the wrong body is, who put you there? Who are you and how did you get into the wrong body? Anyway, so moving time forward, um, I went on to be governor of Greenock and I hasten to add, it's just the jail, not the entire town, just in case you think I'm a big megalomaniac here. So uh, I became governor of Greenock and they, had a, uh, uh, they held mostly men, but they had a women's unit in there as well. And an amazing thing started to happen. So we've gone from having one, two at most trans women in prison to an absolute explosion. So in a short nine years or so, we went from having two across the estate to 23. Now, they weren't all located in the women's prison because some of them are just considered way too dangerous. And this is the first point where self-ID becomes an issue. Because if self-ID becomes law, we will not be able to stop any of them going to the women's prison. No matter what they've done, no matter what their profile is, whether they're multiple rapists or whatever, they will have to go to the women's prison because that will be the law. Now, whenever you raise this with government, with MPs, with MSPs, from most of the parties, all you get back is we are committed to upholding the 2010 Equality Act. This government has not once done one single thing to uphold the single sex exceptions in the 2010 Equality Act. The ones that say that you can legally exclude trans women from women's spaces, services and sports. So I have absolutely no faith in them. The other thing of course is that you get a fair number of uh, people in prison, mostly men, who really just want to bugger up the system. And they will do anything at all to make it difficult for you and the staff. Listen, it's, it's a bit of entertainment for them, isn't it? Prison's really boring. I don't blame them. But what you will see if we make it really, really easy to get to the women's estate is a flood of people trying to get, of men trying to get to the women's estate. It will happen. So when I was in Greenock, we had, I think, three or four uh, trans women in at once. And it was a horrific situation. Um, they were, without except none of them had identified as trans before they came into prison, I have to say. And their behaviour was appalling. They were clearly, I would suggest, most of them there for sexual reasons. And we used to have, uh, there was one particular person who would, and I know there's children at the back, this is really awkward, but um, if I just say that they were wearing... Um, really tight leggings in an obvious state of arousal, I hope that goes over the kids' heads, and parading about in front of the women like that. Now, Greenock is a prison that doesn't have in-cell sanitation, so it meant that the women were using showers, you know, with the, do you remember the old style doors you used to get in the baths? I'm, I'm old enough to, I don't they're like now, I can't swim, I've given up trying. But you know the doors that come to here and here kind of thing? Now, in that situation, male staff are not allowed to go anywhere near those showers, they can't go anywhere near them. But, of course, trans women can. And I knew of women who wouldn't shower or had to pick the times that they would shower. We had a trans woman who loved to shout loudly on the phone to his partner outside about what he was going to do to her when he got out. Massively, massively sexualised talk. And the other turning point that came for me was months before I left, obviously I retired very early, but months before I left... Um, there was a woman in, and some of you have heard me talk about this woman before, she was a life sentence prisoner, and she had really turned her life around. She was a trusted prisoner, she was a mentor to new prisoners, she was someone that I spoke to to kind of take the temperature of what was going on. And I came on one Monday morning to discover that she had been caught using drugs and was in a, in a bad way. And once we'd given her a couple of days to sort of calm down, and so on, I went to speak to her and I said, what happened? And she said... I had an argument with, with her, and she said, can I see him? And I said, yes, you can. She said, I had an argument with her, or him, and he punched the wall really violently, and I thought he was going to assault me. She said, and all of my trauma comes from being assaulted right throughout my childhood by violent men. She said, and it just threw me right back to where I was, and I, I just looked for drugs and got them. And I felt so ashamed to be the governor of that prison where we were doing that to the most traumatised people in society. And, you know, since I've left and since I've been speaking in public and making these arguments, 
I have heard people say, well, you know, there's male officers in there, and some of them aren't good to them. And, and I dare say that there have, up and down the country, been sexual assaults um, committed by male officers. I don't doubt that. But it's an utter nonsense to suggest that because some bad things are happening, we should compound it and make it worse. Now, the other thing that you'll often hear is that trans women are at risk in the male estate. Um, I don't, I've, I've got no evidence of that from Scotland at all. Uh, and I dare say they would be at heightened risk in, in some circumstances. There are lots of subgroups of men who are at risk in the male estate. Gay men are more at risk. Uh, people, informers, are more at risk. Uh, people who have done the dirty and organised crime gangs, people are in for sexual offences, um, ex-prison officers and police officers. Not do, do we never, never consider putting them in the female estate because they are men and so are trans women? Again, if self-ID comes in, we will not be able to stop this. Now, one of the criticisms of people that me speaking out was that um, I was speaking on behalf of women in prison. So about 18 months ago, a trans-friendly researcher did some research with women in prison. And their main, con their main criticism was that uh, nobody had heard the voices of women in prison, despite the fact that people at me were recounting direct things we had been told and knew about. He also criticised suggestions that 80% of women in prison were against having trans women located with them. So he carried out, and you know he's trans friendly because he uses terms like cis. You know, so you can't just be a woman anymore. You're either a trans woman or a cis woman, a trans man or a cis man. He uses terms like assigned at birth, sex or gender even worse, assigned at birth, as if it's not observed and recorded, it's assigned. And he also used the word TERF, and this was in his... Um, his research report that was published. So that's trans exclusionary radical feminists, which I, I don't consider myself to be. So remember, he criticised a, re, a report saying that 80% of women were against trans women in prison. And when he did his own study, he had to conclude that 80% of women were against having trans women in prison with them. In fact, his sample, his sample was quite small. It was 15 women, but they were very in-depth interviews. And only three of them, it says, three of them were almost completely accepting of trans women. So in fact, nobody was. None of these women were completely accepting of trans women being in beside them. Despite all of that, the title of the article is still a quote, she was just like a lassie. Despite that as well, of all the quotes he puts in from the women he interviewed, he includes 20 pro-trans quotes and 15 not pro-trans quotes, despite the fact that 80% of his sample were against it. And I'm going to read you some of the things that he has put in. This was one woman. She's still a guy. Am I allowed to say that? The problem for women in prison is if they call a trans woman he or say that's a man, they will go on report. So a lot of women are scared to speak out. Because when it comes to things like parole, they take account of your behaviour in prison. And if you've got num numerous reports against you, it will go against you. So women are afraid to speak out. And at a day-to-day -day level, if you go and report in front of someone like me, it's like a mini court procedure, um, we can take away your privileges. So you can take away things like access to the television, use of the gym, all of these kind of things. So women are genuinely afraid to speak out. Um, one of them told a story about when a trans woman was admitted to the unit, sat down with a group of women at a table, and within five minutes said, before they'd even got to know anybody, oh aye, that 50 shades of grey, that was too timid and mild for me. And the woman said, this was from a big heavy man, a big intimidating man. This was another one. Um, he told us he wanted to get here so he could have sex with loads of lassies. This was another one, a woman who said, on three occasions, someone who had identified as a woman stopped immediately they get out of prison because women keep in touch with people outside and they know these things. The other group of people that this researcher looked at was staff. So he spoke to lots of female and male staff. 
And again, the vast majority of them are hugely sceptical about trans people in prison. Most of the female officers do not want to rub down and search intact males. And I had an email from a young female prison officer not that long ago who said that the first naked male she saw was a trans woman in prison and she was deeply shocked by it. Now, the Scottish Prison Service has traditionally had a great deal of trouble recruiting women from black and minority ethnic communities to join. In fact, they've had a great deal of trouble recruiting men or women to work as prison officers. Which of them is going to come in if they've got to search males? I mean, it's not, you know, this could apply to any women, but I would suggest more likely to the people we're trying to target to bring in to make the prison service more representative of our community. It's an absolute outrage. People have asked me about uh, women who identify as males being sent to the male estate. Now, the same in theory applies to them. You hardly ever get anybody in prison. In my whole time in prison service, I met one, one trans man. And I believe shortly after I left the service, they were transferred to a male prison and they had to be transferred again back really, really quickly. There is an inherent understanding that women are at risk among large populations of men, but there is no willingness to admit that if you put a man in a population of women, you put those women at risk. Now, while I was in the prison service, I did try to speak up about this. I didn't go on and on to the staff about it because that wouldn't have been right, but I did speak to my superiors on a few occasions. I tried to warn them what was coming down the line. I warned them that groups like For Women Scotland wouldn't put up with this for long. And I suggested to them that they needed to address this sooner or later. Nothing was done. Uh, when staff at the prison I was in were threatening not to do the searches that they were being required to do of the, the opposite sex, I said to headquarters, I support them and I will not force them to do it. And I was told that I was being very unhelpful in quite an intimidating way. So everyone is kind of caught up in this in prisons. It's, it's just become the thing. The prison service is a command and control organisation. So the people to blame for this, as far as I'm concerned, is Scottish government. Scottish government could stop this tomorrow if they would enact the single sex exemptions that they claim they care about in the 2010 Equality Act. I now have no political axe to grind. I'm not a member of any political party and I will, maybe not vote Tory, but I will uh, support any individual who stands up for the rights of women and especially women in prison. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you all for coming. Um, I am going to talk about the school guidance, um, supporting transgender pupils in schools, guidance for Scottish schools issued by the Scottish Government um, in August of this year. And I want to start by reading a quote from page nine um, to talk to you a little bit about the origin of this guidance. This guidance has been developed from supporting transgender young people, which was developed and published by LGBT Youth Scotland in 2017. The guidance is therefore based on the experiences of transgender young people and good practice approaches suggested by school staff and a wide range of professionals with expertise in the field of education and human rights. Now, I did not read you that quote because I agree with it. I read you that quote because it's completely and utterly ridiculous to claim that LGBT youth's guidance contains good practice approaches. Um, the reason why the Scottish Government, which incidentally funded and endorsed the LGBT youth guidance, something they don't tell us, um, the only reason why they had to issue their own guidance is because of this document, which is a children's rights impact assessment done by volunteers um, 
and published by a group called Women and Girls in Scotland in January 2019. And in this uh, impact assessment, or for this impact assessment, um, the group used a template from the Children's and Young People's Commissioner in Scotland. Um, and they looked at the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Equality Act and relevant Scottish safeguarding frameworks and found that the LGBT youth guidance did not, in fact, contain good practice approaches. But if it was applied as written, would lead to breaching the rights of pupils, in particular girls and pupils from religious minorities. And um, this was a problem, of course, because we submitted, um, I was one of the authors of the um, impact assessment, we submitted this to the Children's Commissioner who confirmed that our assessment was correct. They wrote a letter to the Scottish Government um, also in January 2019, reminding the government that they had to ensure that all guidance issued to schools in Scotland had to be legal. The Scottish government said, nothing to do with us. We didn't write it. Which, of course, is ridiculous when your logo is on the front of the, guide, of, of the LGBT youth <coughs> guidance and you've paid for it. What followed after that was an acknowledgement in June 2019 in Parliament that this guidance, if it was used as written, would actually lead to girls being excluded from their own spaces. And they promised to write a new guidance which would take into account the rights of all children. And they certainly claim that they have talked to a wide range of professionals with expertise in the field of education and human rights but we know that was a very narrow field. They did not widely consult with disability rights experts. They did not widely consult with family law experts, women's rights experts, religious rights experts, therapists with experience in treating children with gender dysphoria, or detransitioners who identified as trans as children, but now as adults no longer do, and who are increasingly telling their stories, stories which tell us that the affirmative approach now used in schools is not a neutral act, but in fact it can have far-reaching consequences for children. And it's a therapeutic approach that teachers are not qualified and not entitled to make on behalf of children without talking to parents. And yet that is something that happens. We actually have one case in Scotland of a mum who has been fighting her child's school, who has had the advice of three different mental health experts saying that transitioning at school is bad for her child and the school insists on doing it against the advice of mental health experts. She's currently fighting to just support her child through her last year of school. But that is not right. You should not have teachers decide that they know better than the mental health professionals treating the child or the parents. Um, so I'm going to give you a few examples as to why this guidance um, is really not actually helpful for teachers. It puts teachers in a really untenable position in that they may well be breaching the rights of children, including the children who identify as trans, if they follow this guidance. And the Scottish government, as it always does, has already said responsibility, legal liability, does not lie with the Scottish government who's written this guidance. It lies with the head teacher or the teacher. Um, which is why the Union of uh, the Scottish Union of Secondary School Teachers has already asked for this guidance to be improved, because of course they understand that this puts teachers in a really bad position. Um, <clears throat> what I would like you to take away from this today is that if you really, really cared about the pupils struggling 
with their identity, with gender dysphoria, you would not put an ideology above the health and well-being of the child. You would work with parents, you would work with mental health professionals, and you would not oppose parents or therapists in the approach that you're taking at school. Um, <clears throat> so I'm uh, going to say that um, the, <laughs> the Scottish government in this, in, in the preamble to all of their guidance, they actually talk about the fact that they believe that this um, incorporates and respects the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and you just have to look at one thing and you know it does not. Because if it keeps information about a child from parents and says that I'm going to keep this a secret, for children as young as four, it does not respect the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child because Articles 5 and 18 in particular are about the responsibilities of parents to support their children. Article 18 obliges the Scottish Government to assist parents in fulfilling their responsibilities to their children. Now, how are they doing that if at the same time they keep saying that information must be kept from parents, which is not neutral either? That's a suggestion that your parents are not to be trusted. That's really hostile to parents. Something I'm, I'm really struggling to understand is where this hostility to parents is coming from. Um, the guidance is contradictory throughout. It quotes the General Teaching Council's Code of Professionalism and Conduct. Um, under 5.1, this Code of Conduct states that teachers are expected to engage and work positively with pupils and parents. And yet it recommends withholding information from parents. Um, under 5.2, it states that it should help pupils understand different views, perspectives, and experiences, but this guidance does not acknowledge that the doctrine of gender identity is an ideology that people might reasonably disagree with. After all, this idea, this ideology of gender identity, it denies evolution. It is wholly unscientific and unevidenced, it completely ignores normal knowledge. The knowledge that we have collected about child development for decades, which is well established. Um, and of course, um, in some of the, in some of the um, articles in here, it talks about transphobic bullying and things like that which includes not believing a child when they say they are the opposite sex. Um, so I'm going to give you a few examples um, why this guidance really needs to be reworked. On page 21, it talks about withholding information from parents again. It does this constantly. And it suggests that no information should be shared with the parents of the child unless the child agrees. Now, we're talking, this guidance applies to primary schools as well as secondary schools, so we are talking about very small children, four, five, six, seven-year-olds who think Santa is going to come visit their house. Very happily looking forward to that. And yet the government believes they can make their own decisions about whether or not their parents should know about this. If you are a teacher, that's not very helpful because <clears throat> the guidance really, really leaves you in doubt. Can you? Can you share this information? It does talk about your legal responsibilities as if information sharing is not allowed. But the Scottish safeguarding framework, getting it right for every child, rightly acknowledges that a failure of information sharing is at the heart of most of our really horrific cases where things have gone very wrong and children have been harmed or killed. Um, one part of this problem with information sharing is secret keeping. If you know anything about safeguarding, then you do know 
that you don't ever encourage any adult who's not a parent to keep secrets with the child. That is one step on the way to grooming children. We discourage it not because keeping a secret with the child is automatically an act of grooming. We discourage it because we want the children to understand that you don't keep secrets with adults, just on principle. Now, the guidance um, asks that pupils respect pronouns, including neo-pronouns, including children who change their pronouns quite regularly. And this has, of course, uh, unsurprisingly, led to this being used to bully other children. So you can complain, he has used the wrong pronouns for me, and then these children will be reprimanded for that. I don't know how you are expected to know. I mean, I've heard of some children who wear different colored rings to let everybody know what pronoun they want that day. I have no idea why we're indulging anything like that because that's really confusing. We wouldn't do it for anything else, but we're doing it for this. Um, the guidance the, from a women's rights campaign or from a girl's rights campaign, the thing that I find the most upsetting is it pays lip service to girls' rights, but then writes on page 26, rather misleadingly, that there is no law in Scotland which states that only people assigned male at bath can use men's toilets and changing rooms, or that only people assigned female can use women's toilets and changing rooms. This is instead done by social convention. Well, yes. That's actually quite true. There's a UK law, however, that allows us to use something called a sex-based exemption for single-sex provisions or separate sex provisions if both sexes need something. So there might not be a law in Scotland that bans a man from a woman's toilet, but if we use the sex-based exemptions from UK law, we can actually do that. It's very disappointing that the Scottish government at first says it respects the rights of girls and then write some what what is the purpose of the sentence other than to suggest that we can't really by law have single sex toilets which is very surprising because we actually do have scottish building regulations which stipulate that we must have single sex toilets and changing rooms for all children above the age of eight um, <clears throat> It then goes on to quote from the Equality and Human Rights Commission, which has actually got quite useful guidance for schools in Scotland on how to deal with children who identify as trans, but it stops short of quoting what the Equality and Human Rights Commission says, which is that children who identify as trans should not automatically be allowed to use an opposite sex toilet. They should be offered an alternative if they want it. That's what the HRC says, but um, the Scottish government has chosen not to quote that. <clears throat> One of the things that, um, if you are a, a human rights sort of expert, human rights lawyer, um, or actually, if you are a lawyer at all, one of the things that will be very concerning is that it cons consistently says um, that only after a complaint has been made should you consider the rights of all children. Uh -huh. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that really weird because I either respect the rights of all children and I consider them going in, or I ask for trouble. Because not all children have parents who can champion their rights. Not all children are confident enough to say something. If you talk to girls who've been abused as children, they very often will tell you, as uh, if you talk to women who were abused as girls, they will very often tell you they had no understanding that they were allowed boundaries. And they had to learn this later. This is the point where our schools, our teachers, and we as parents would be stepping in to support children. And yet the Scottish government thinks that we can ignore the rights of all children until someone's complained. And um, on safety, on page 29, it talks about safety, and it talks about the fact that if 
someone complains about an opposite sex pupil in your toilet, and this is clearly talking about girls complaining about boys in their toilets, misconceptions about the child who identifies as trans should be addressed. It's not a misconception if your instincts are telling you, I don't feel comfortable with a boy in my space. And it flies in the face of everything we teach our children about consent and about keeping themselves safe. If we tell them you can assert boundaries against all members of the male sex, that's one thing. But according to this, we are now teaching children, girls in particular, well, you can do that unless the boy says he's a girl. In that case, you have to ignore your instincts and you have to shut up about it. And um, page 30, and I'll finish with that, is really, truly concerning and very upsetting because that is a paste and copy from the original LGBT youth guidance on binding. Binding is a practice of self-harm where girls who identify as boys bind their breasts and... Um, there is no safe way to bind your breast. In a survey with over a thousand adult women who were binding their breasts, done by a pro-binding organization, so you can't really say they looked for this, 97% of all the women who were binding their breasts had at least one bad side effect. Those bad side effects can start with pain, but they can go to lung infections, skin infections, scarring, misshapen spines, misshapen ribs, um, really serious problems. 50% experienced at least two serious side effects. 5% experienced broken ribs. Now, the guidance says that this isn't, uh, that this is something, binding is not something to be concerned about. There is absolutely nothing in here saying that if a child, if a girl binds her breast, she should not be doing PE. It doesn't take much to imagine what might happen if a girl has a broken rib and she does go and do PE, because you can puncture a lung and cause some serious problems. Now, I want you to consider that this was done, this is a survey of adults who were using all kinds of binders, self-made ones, commercial binders, sports bras, adults who can be relied on to follow the instructions. Now we're talking about 12 year olds doing that, who half the time won't take a telling, half the time won't even read the instructions. So if 97% of adults were having serious problems with binding their breasts, I think we can safely say that it'll be 100% of girls who do it, and there is nothing in here at all that suggests that this might be a practice we don't support. Now, schools actually do have um, procedures and processes in place if they become aware of children self-harming. Those processes should come into play, but they're not. Because, as I've said earlier, this is not guidance that shows a real concern for the health and well-being of pupils. This is guidance that is concerned only with an ideology. Thank you. I started work in 1980. I left school green as grass and came to work in Alloa. I was in awe of the fact that I was going to be a lawyer and I very rapidly learned that there were a couple of aspects of the law in Clipmanshire that set this wee county above and beyond the rest. And one was this, that our former MP, George Reid, was responsible for a piece of legislation that transformed the lives of hundreds of thousands of the women of Scotland, and it was called the Matrimonial Homes Family Protection Act. It enabled abusive men, nowadays abusive partners, female as well as male, to be excluded from the family home in the event that their behaviour was deemed to be potentially or actually harmful to the health and the well-being of their wife, partner or children. That was seen to be worldwide a fabulous development for the protection of women and children, enhancement of family life. 
And it was good that the MP who introduced that legislation was one of my heroes and a man born and brought up and educated in Clackmannanshire. He came for Tullabuddy, he went to school in Tullabuddy in Alloa and Dollar and he made a name for his cell on the world stage. But the other thing that was good about Clackmannanshire from my professional perspective was Clackmannanshire Women's Aid was a fantastic resource, a haven, a safety net for women from all over the United Kingdom. Women who were fleeing domestic abuse came to Clackmannanshire because they hadn't heard of it. They didn't know where it was and they hoped that their abusive partners didn't know where it was either. So very rapidly, because I was one of the only girls studying law and subsequently practicing law in this part of the world, I suddenly had clients from all over the United Kingdom. Women and their children and their mothers and their pals and their sisters and their witnesses that told me stories that sometimes prevented me leaving my desk and I started working night shifts. I would do ghosters, working day and night and the next day to get cases into court, to get legal aid applications done, to try to get temporary protections for women and for their children, either to get their men put out of their houses so the women could go back and live there safely with their children, or because we had a really progressive, helpful, understanding housing department in Clackmannanshire then, writing letters to homeless officers saying and pleading for a change of tenancy or a transfer for a woman who had been rendered homeless as a result of abuse. So that couple of years, of my, first couple of years of my career was a serious eye-opener, the likes of which I've never seen since. So it's with an enormous sense of regret that I find myself 40 years later wondering what the hell has gone wrong with a political party, a government I helped to elect, and a system of law, a rule of law, that I've spent 40 years promoting and protecting and I hope trying to make better. Because I find nowadays that the person that runs a rape crisis centre and a person who was involved in women's aid generally isn't a woman, it's a man. A man that arrived for India, colony cell of women, now runs Edinburgh Rape Crisis and has worked in women's aid. And I can't get my head around the fact that the Scottish Government thinks that that's okay. And that there are people in this room who can't get their heads around it either, who know that they'd be battering their head against a brick wall if they tried to speak to a councillor, an MSP or an MP and get them to understand what is so very wrong with that entire set of circumstances. Now, what's gone wrong is that people have been captured by this transgender ideology. Now, Rona spoke about issues in prisons, and I'll read a wee quote to you, which is entirely genuine, and I, I would urge those of you who have not read it already to have a wee look at an item written by the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies, and it says, In 2018, the manager of the Scottish Trans Alliance, a man called James Morton, who helped to write the Scottish Prison Service policy on transgender prisons, prisoners, said, We strategised that by working intensively with the Scottish Prison Service to support them to include trans women as women on a self-declaration basis within very challenging circumstances, we would be able to ensure that all other public services should be able to do likewise. There you've got it. I've no made it up. It's there in black and white. Female prisoners in the female prison estate were the canaries in the coal mine to be experimented on as the result of the transgender policies written for and adopted by the Scottish Government and they are being implemented across the board, including now in this transgender guidance for schools. Now, where that's offensive for most folk is that it entirely cuts across the complete concept of the protected characteristics of the Equality Act of 2010. Basically, what it says uh, is that there are nine areas of life where you're entitled not to be discriminated against. Out of those nine, the word gender does not appear. Gender reassignment is there and sex is there. Race is there, religion is there, disability is there as well. 
But basically what the Equality Act 2010 says is you are entitled to insist on single sex species for dignity, safety, protection. And that is why women have women's aid refuges for women, run by women. That's why women have the right to ask for a female medical practitioner. That's why victims, female victims of indecency, have the right to ask to be examined by a female. However, the Scottish Government is quite clearly keen on extending the definition of female to include male. And if you want more evidence of that, this very day, there was an advert for, I think, seven, if I've got this right, volunteers to work with, I think it's Edinburgh Rape it's Crisis, Edinburgh. if I can find the ad. Here we go. Edinburgh Rape Crisis. We are recruiting for seven volunteer counsellors. If you're interested in supporting survivors, developing your counselling skills and experience, and joining a diverse group of supportive women, then we would love to hear from you. Find out more and get involved. So I thought I'll get involved. <laughs> what does the role involve? We ask you to see three survivors a week. Make a commitment of at least 12 months to the service. Monthly supervision and training will be provided. Additional information. We operate a policy of equal opportunities and we welcome applications from self-identifying women from all walks of life, particularly keen to hear from women who belong to underrepresented groups, for example, women from black, Asian and other ethnic minority backgrounds, lesbian, disabled and trans women. Trans women, that's men, can apply, can volunteer to give counselling to female victims of rape in Scotland in 2021. However, the advert goes on to say, only women need apply for the above rules in terms of Schedule 9, Part 1 of the Equality Act 2010. That's the part of the Equality Act that says some jobs are allowed to be restricted for a certain sex only. So women can apply, but women can apply, but only women can apply, but the women that can apply can include trans women, which includes men. So the Scottish Government have already made it official in terms of adverts like that, that the definition of women now includes man, even when these Equality Act exceptions are supposed to be taken into account. We know they've been swept aside and it's official government policy. Now, another slightly less known official government policy is slightly shelved at the moment, but I would imagine that's temporary, and that's to do with hospitals. Now, I don't imagine there's very many women in here too keen on sharing an award with a man. Well, you better hope that you're not going to be in Fourth Valley Hospital or in hospital in Glasgow sometime soon because the Greater Glasgow Health Board transgender advice, which is currently suspended, says something similar to the prison's advice. And what it says is that the, the, the patient is entitled to the service for the gender into which the patient um, wishes to transition. So if I'm a man and I've decided I'm a woman, I'm entitled to be put into a women's ward. So when I'm in the women's ward, and there's a woman in the ward who thinks I'm a man and thinks I shouldn't be there. And this woman, female patient, objects and says to the nurse, that's a man. No, what a man in here? The guidance from Greater Glasgow Health Board online, because I've read it, says that the nurse should say in terms, word for word, to the objecting female patient, this is a female only ward. Only females are treated here. And if the female patient says, I'm damn sure that's a man, and I'm not wanting a man in my ward. What the nurse is to do is to say, and I have told you already, and I'm not allowed to tell you again, this is a female ward, we treat only females here. And if at that point the female patient continues to object, she's to be reported because she's committing a hate crime. Now that is exactly what the guidance says. It's currently suspended. 
It's not written out, it's not written off, it's not cancelled, it's suspended. The advice in the Forth Valley is exactly the same. Now, that's not to say that they're going to implement it, but they're maybe needing folk like yourselves to be in touch loudly to say that you don't want it to be implemented and why. Now, beyond that, I'd like to say a little in relation to issues that Marin raised in connection with, with parental rights and responsibilities. And again, this is where I find myself heartbroken at what's gone wrong in Scotland. When I started work, occasionally there were disputes between parents to do with, with arrangements for children, but they weren't particularly commonplace because it was generally accepted that folk could sort these things out themselves. But when there were disputes, the, the terminology used was custody and access. Eventually, as the result of various developments in Europe, the Scottish Government was encouraged to get involved with discussions about children's needs and rights. And an act um, was passed in Westminster that related only to Scotland, subsequently amended slightly by the Scottish Parliament, and it's to do with parental responsibilities and rights over children. So nowadays, what we talk about is that parents have duties towards their children, and parents have rights to enable them to satisfy these duties. So the child is the centre of the legislation. The child is no longer owned by the parent. The child is not a possession. What you look at is the child's welfare, the child's well-being, the child's best interests. And the entire ethos of all of that law is that the child should always be at the centre of all decisions made by the parents, and that the parents should take account of each other's views, each other's... Um, feelings and ambitions and hopes for the child. And one of the main objectives of this legislation is to make sure that a child, as far as is possible, grows up with a very rounded view of the world and gets guidance from the two people in his or her life that should be the most important to them. And one overriding aspect of that is that there aren't meant to be secrets. Parents are not meant to keep secrets from each other and they're not meant to keep secrets from their children. But parents are entitled and obliged to be involved in their children's education and in their children's health. And they're entitled and obliged to be open, to obtain information and to convey information to the people that deal with their children on a daily basis. What they've not to do is what the transgender guidance, as quoted by Marin, authorises teachers to do, which is get a bit of information, keep it to themselves and not pass it on. And especially where this becomes important is Parents won't always agree, obviously, on what's best for their children. And there will be circumstances where sheriffs or, at times, children's panels have to intervene. And when that happens, what is hugely important is that there's complete transparency in relation to who says what to whom and when about a child's life, a child's hopes, a child's ambitions and a child's fears. But what I've found over the years, working with families and working with children and reading case notes and case files and being involved with social work cases and, and, and horrible things that people do and things that occur with children and we know of one particular case that's hit the headlines recently that's absolutely heartbreaking. What most often goes wrong is when information is not passed on and it's not passed on to the right people at the right time. And it's very easy to blame professionals and it's easy to say it was a system failure or he knew but he didn't pass the information off, he went on holiday, she was off sick, nobody else picked up the file in their absence, whatever it is. But there's lots of wee hearts broken and little lives that are broken as the result of information being withheld and information not being passed on. So for the Scottish Government to issue a set of guidance to comprehensive schools, that's state schools in Scotland, not faith schools, not private schools, but only state-run comprehensive schools that says it's okay to keep secrets, it's okay to let children think they can confide in you, is, to my mind, driving a coach and horses through everything that the Scottish legal system ever did to protect and enhance the rights of children and the rights of parents too. So, to finish up, the Scotland that we're living in today is not the Scotland I grew up in. It's not the Scotland I want my son and his children to grow up in either. And it's dramatic to say it, but what we're facing now, in many respects, is the fight of our lives. 
if women are being eradicated and girls are being eradicated, I can promise you that the lawyers that come after me are going to have a lot of heartbreak to deal with, far, far worse than anything that I've ever seen. We will see hospitals and we will see women's aid refuges and rape crisis centres either overrun by nutters who are allowed to call themselves women when they're men with beards and full equipment, shall we say, given the children at the back of the room. But what will happen is the women that need those services won't go. And see the women that I met that escaped. Some of them are only going to escape because they're not going to have anywhere to go to. Now, you can imagine some of the stories that I've heard. I've heard just as many from men that were in difficult circumstances, but it's usually not as hard for them to fight back. Women are weaker. They're not generally able to fight back. If they're trapped within a home where they are being abused, they're short of money, they think, well, I can go up the road there, I can get a hold of my mum and my sister and my pal, I can phone this number, I can get there, I can arrive there, and they get to the door of the refuge, and who's standing there? A man in a dress that says, you're not getting in here unless you leave your bigotry behind, because I'm no a man, I'm a woman, yeah. and I'm here to counsel you with my big man's hands. That's life in Scotland today. Now, is that what we want? <coughs> is that why we've got a female <coughs> First Minister? Is that what our MP was elected to do? Is it what our MSP was elected to do? Is it what our councillors are required to achieve for us? Well, you've all got councillors, they've all got surgeries, you've all got MPs and MSPs, so have they. Get talking to them, because together we'll change it. But see if we all sit back and wheeshed, they'll get away with it. And a lot of innocent people will be harmed, and a lot of innocent people will lose their lives because they'll not be able to go out there and get the help that they need because it will be denied to them as the result of an ideology that is utterly warped. Thank you.